Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for inviting us to be here with you today. I am Mala Tun from the University of New Mexico. My collaborator, Francesca Yensenius, is from the University of Oslo. And today we're going to be talking about some of our research on family law and women's economic empowerment. I'm just going to take a minute and share my screen with you. All right. So just let me start by giving you a, a background to the work that we're going to present today. Since the 1960s, we have seen a uh, rights revolution um, for women worldwide. And by that, I refer to legal changes and policy reforms in multiple topical areas. For example, countries that used to allow companies to fire women from work when they became pregnant, to put women on separate career tracks, uh, were prevented from doing that. Um, women were given the right to equal pay, um, equal opportunities at work. Many countries enacted legislation to prevent and punish violence against women. Countries expanded women's rights to reproductive freedom. They expanded social provisions such as support for parental leave and support for childcare. And many countries also took action to give women equal rights um, in marriage, for example, over property, inheritance rights, the right of married women to work, um, changes in the area we call family law. However, these global changes in women's rights have not been even or uniform. We've seen changes um, in some areas more than other areas. And one of the issues that has been the most challenging to reform in some places is family law. So today we're going to talk about um, global variation in family law. Um, we're going to identify the places where family law remains restrictive. And then we're going to conduct an analysis which will show you that family law is significantly associated with women's economic empowerment. And in fact, that family law is, has a greater degree of association with different indicators of women's economic empowerment than um, labor law and social policy, such as parental leave. So I'm going to turn it over to Francesca now, who's going to talk about um, our published article on this topic. Great. Thank you, Mala. Um, so the paper I'm reporting from, or we're talking about right now, is um, a paper by, by Mala, Jamie Nelson Nunez, and myself, published in Social Politics uh, last year. And the main question we were interested in this paper um, is to what extent the variation in gender discriminatory laws is reflected uh, in women's economic conditions. Um, I say reflected because we are interested in I guess the causal relationship between different laws and outcomes. Um, however, it's really hard to um, really capture the causal effects of laws, particularly in cross uh, sectional data, which is what we're looking at. So as a starting point, at least, we look at correlations, associations. Um, and so our question is really uh, about the association between different types of laws and um, different indicators of women's economic uh, conditions. And in particular, what types of legal provisions are associated with what types of outcomes? So trying to disaggregate um, uh, both women's rights and women's economic um, empowerment. So what we're leveraging here is really cool new data um, by the World Bank, uh, Women, Business and the Law. Um, Women, Business and the Law is a project that has been going on since 2008. And the team has collected data on a wide range of laws and regulations to measure global progress towards gender equality. And so we draw on the 2014 data and the 2016 data, uh, which um, at least the 2016 data covers 173 economies, that's 171 uh, countries. It's very, very rich data that looks at different types of legal provisions. Um, theoretically, we are interested in three types of laws. Um, and the first one here is legal provisions that constrain women's mobility and choices and actions. And that's what we call restrictions on legal capacity. 
So from the uh, uh, women, business and the law data, we picked out 15 questions that in different ways tap into this idea. And based on those, um, we, we aggregate them to get a number between zero and 15, uh, which measures as an index of how uh, many restrictions women experience in the country. So um, theoretically here, you could have up to 15 legal restrictions in the actual data. We don't see more than 11. Let's just talk about some of the examples of what we're measuring here. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so for example, when we're talking about restrictions on legal capacity, we're talking about um, issues like do married men and married women have equal ownership rights to property? Do sons and daughters have equal rights to inherit assets from their parents? Can a married woman register a business in the same way as a married man? Can a married woman open a bank account in the same way as a married man? So basically, does the law permit women to exercise the same degree of freedom and agency to be an economic actor as a man, or are there additional asymmetrical restrictions imposed on her? Perfect. Thank you, Lala. Um, I can also add to that that um, our theoretical expectation then is that those kind of restrictions are going to be really important for women's ability to hold a job, for example, or to own assets. And so in the map we're showing here, we, sh we see the distribution across the world in these restrictions on women's legal capacity. And you can see that most countries have very few restrictions. And 97 countries in the, in the data have no restrictions at all. And then we have 25 countries that have one restriction, um, which mainly is that uh, women can't get citizenship conferred on non-national uh, spouse, uh, whereas a men can. Um, 20 countries have unequal inheritance laws. Uh, and then we have Iran and Sudan, which are the countries uh, that are really uh, red here with 11 restrictions in total. And also Jordan, Qatar and Saudi Arabia have 10 restrictions each. So we have some examples of countries here with a lot of restrictions on women's legal capacity. Now, the second index we look at, the second data we look at, is we call it discrimination in wage work or, or rights that are, um, uh, are conducive to discrimination in wage work. Here we look at 14 different questions, which include things like whether non-pregnant and non-nursing women can work the same night hours as men, work in jobs deemed hazardous in the same way as men, etc. So these uh, are, are the type of rights that are usually not embedded in family law, but rather in different labor codes. Um, and so our expectation is that these also matter for particularly maybe the type of jobs that women have or the kind of um, wage gap you see in the country, uh, but perhaps not for their ability to uh, own uh, asset or have a job at all. And so here we see much more variation. So the scale runs from zero to 14 and the average is 4.8. Uh, countries like Australia, Norway, Portugal, um, and Slovakia have a score of zero, so no discrimination in um, laws contributing to discrimination in wage work, while uh, Syria has 14, um, and countries like Mali, uh, Egypt, Syria, uh, no, Mali, Kuwait, um, DRC, and Madagascar have more than 10 restrictions. So here there's much more variation. And the Let most common... Add... Yeah, go for it, Mali. Oh, you finish and then I just want to add one thing before we move on. Perfect. Uh, so the most common restriction here is the lack of uh, regulation ensuring equal treatment. So I just wanted to underscore what Francesca just said, that this indicator combines both um, the absence of restrictions as well as formal equal rights. So for example, um, look toward the bottom of the list and you see does the law mandate non-discrimination uh, based on gender in hiring? Um, does it prohibit the dismissal of pregnant workers? Um, so equal opportunity laws, such as those uh, implied by countries that sign the UN Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women or CEDAW. Um, CEDAW mandated legislation is also included in this indicator. All right. Perfect. And then our last indicator is whether countries have publicly paid parental leave, which is something that can 
help women hold a job or be economically independent. Um, and here we see that most countries have it. 70% have some kind of publicly paid parental leave. The US is always a great example, but does not have it. Um, but there is lots of variation in how much and also the extent to which you get um, coverage for the time you take off. But the glo global average here is a total leave of 168 days. Mal, do you want to add something here as well before we move on? Um, so just about the US, the US is notoriously the only advanced democracy which lacks nationally mandated um, or nationally organized paid leave. There are, however, four states that offer some form of paid parental leave, but it's for a shorter period, uh, only, about, only about six weeks. But okay. I actually think that's a really important thing you just pointed out as well, that these data are at the national level. And so in yeah. many countries, there might actually be variation within the country. Um, and one thing is that there might be actual legal variation, uh, then there, there may also be um, great variation in terms of the extent to which the law is actually followed. So that's a, that's a variation that's really important to keep in mind when we talk about these uh, cross-national patterns. And so let me just add something. I think that's a really good point, how the World Bank coded these legal rights, because since some countries don't just have geographical variation, but they have multiple legal systems, they might have um, a, a, a statutory or civil law, they might have customary law, and then they might have religious law for people who identify as members of particular religious communities. What the World Bank did is that they coded the law from the standpoint of a woman working in the country's major financial center. So like New York City or London or Lagos, a woman who is working in one of those cities, what legal framework is most likely to affect her rights and opportunities. That's how they, that's how they coded um, in their data set. Great. Um, and so some key findings that we wanted to highlight here is it, we've, we've created three uh, measures of um, gender discriminatory legislation. Uh, and it's important to note that there is correlation between them, but um, not as strong as you might expect. So for example, the strongest one is uh, a 0 0.5 correlation between the restrictions on women's legal capacity and the laws contributing to gender discrimination in work. Um, while it's only a 0 0.23 correlation between publicly paid parental leave and laws affecting discrimination at work. Um, so these are not picking up the same thing. And so what we also see here is that about half the countries uh, are fairly progressive on one of the dimensions, but not on others. Um, so countries like Australia and Norway and Portugal, Slovakia are progressive on most things. And then you have some countries that are lagging on all these three indicators, but then you also have some that are good on one of them, but not on, not on another. So for example, uh, the former communist zone um, has great legal capacity and high parental leave, but they also have really high workplace discrimination for women. While uh, the OECD in Latin America are mostly equal, the, but the parental leave greatly varies. Um, and so on. So all these things do not necessarily go together. And so the second part we wanted to bring up here is something we already flagged, which is the consequences of discrimination on women's um, economic agency. And we define economic agency here as the ability to make independent economic choices. So based on both um, a disposition to do so and a capacity to do so. And the classic measure of women's economic agency is women's labor force participation. But we want to try to go beyond that and think about how there are various ways in which women can um, have economic agency. So we have, um, uh, we looked at five different indicators of women's economic empowerment, which is basically all the um, cross country uh, decent indicators we were able to find. And so the first one, the percentage of women with a bank account is meant to um, uh, be a proxy for whether women have actual access to money. So whether she uh, actually has control over her own money as opposed to just handing it into the uh, uh, family. The second indicator is asset ownership. Uh, that's the share of firms with women's participation and ownership. So it's not 
covering all types of assets, but it's, um, uh, it's an indicator that covers a large number of countries and therefore is useful in this context. Then there's women's labor force participation, which um, is the classic indicator. Then we also included the share of women working in the informal economy, which we think is crucial um, because the informal economy often have much weaker rights and worse working conditions than the formal economy. And finally, we looked at um, ILO's measure of wage gaps between men and women. And so our expectation here is that these different rights are likely to be associated with um, these different outcomes in different ways. Small, do you want to add something here? No. Perfect. So um, when we look at correlations, we, we run um, just simple models here to look at the associations between our three indicators of legal rights and the five outcomes. And the really striking pattern that um, we wanted to share is that by far the strongest predictor is restrictions on legal capacities, which is the uh, family law. Um, it's very strongly associated with whether you hold a bank account, whether you have firm ownership, um, and whether women are in the labor force at all. It's also negatively associated with women in the informal sector and the wage gap, but those patterns are not statistically significant. In these models here, um, you can notice that we include all the three uh, indicators. Um, these patterns also hold if we um, don't run them together, but run them separately. And we include controls here for the male rate, since that can vary greatly by country. And we also control for GDP per capita, which is a, um, a really important um, predictor of women's economic agency, which really weakens the patterns for all of these five indicators. But despite all of that, restrictions on legal capacity remains a really robust predictor of um, three of our five, in, five indicators of women's economic agency. Let's just mention this um, discrimination in wage work, how we do find an association between um, uh, labor law restrictions, that is the extent to which labor law discriminates against women and um, a gender wage gap, which um, is not surprising. It's what we would expect to see, but it's still important that we see it um, holding in these cross-national patterns. I'm just gonna move on to the next slide, okay. Great. And so um, in the paper, we show a series of these plots. We plot the association between our legal indicators and our different outcomes. And what we think is really crucial here is that on the left, we show just the trend in the raw data. And um, those kind of associations have been shown in various settings and the so association looks really strong. So the more restrictions you have on women's legal capacity, for example, it's way less likely a woman holds a bank account. Uh, the trend is very, very strong. On the right side, we show the trend once we have controlled for GDP and male rate. And we think that's important because um, there is still a trend, but it's much less impressive. And so um, here we don't claim any causal relationship here either. But it is really important to see that, that um, GDP is a really, really strong predictor here. So the law is definitely not everything. I think we can look at the next one. Unless you okay. want to add something more? Well, I just want to make sure that people um, understand uh, th that the left panel is just looking at the overall association between the share of women with a bank account, which you can see on the y-axis and um, our index of family law discrimination. Whereas um, in the right panel, on the right side of the screen, uh, as Francesca said, it's showing the statistical model. Once we take into account the difference in the overall wealth of eco the economy and the differences in um, how many men have a bank account. And so as she said, it's really important to control for those confounding factors because in reality, the share of women overall who have a bank account is something that's really dependent on how large your economy is. I mean, if you have a very advanced economy with a developed financial system um, and a good infrastructure, you're going to have many more women um, with a bank account than uh, a, a much poorer economy with, you know, a GDP per capita of three or four hundred dollars a year. So that's what we're trying to take into account, um, just to clarify. OK, so I'm going to move on to the next slide. Um. It is important to see, though, that both in the last one and this one, 
even if we control for those things, there still is an association. And yes. here we see it more strongly. So this is female labor force participation. We can see that even if we control for the size of the economy, there's actually a really strong association between women's legal capacity and female labor force participation. And so we think it's crucial uh, both to realize um, how important it is to control for stuff uh, and the fact that laws do seem to matter. Again, here we're implying causality. Um, this is something that should be studied further in more detail. And then the th third really important thing to notice here is that there also is great variation. So um, we think it's really interesting to see how countries with a similar number of legal restrictions can have vastly different outcomes when it comes to labor force participation. As we can see by how um, these, these names are short names of countries, they, they end up um, being much higher or lower on the female labor force participation axis. So, so let's just take an example. So if you look at the right panel, you can see that um, if we take a score of three on the family law index, that means a country that has three types of restrictions. For example, women don't have equal inheritance rights. They don't have the same right to work. Um, Uganda uh, is still, still has those, for example, Uganda, UGA, still has a lot of those restrictions, but there are a heck of a lot of women participating in the labor force. Somewhere around 70% of women are, are, are economically active. Whereas um, Tunisia has the same degree of um, restrictions, but there are far fewer women. The share of women who are active in the labor force is, is lower. So it is important to take into account that we see a lot of, of variation um, in outcomes, even with countries with ostensibly similar legal framework. So again, trying to, to conclude some of the main findings we have here. Um, the key thing we're showing here is really that family law is is significantly associated with women's labor force participation and, and other measures of um, uh, women's empowerment, including bank accounts and uh, firm ownership. Uh, importantly, family law is a bigger predictor of these indicators of women's economic empower empowerment than egal egalitarian labor law and parental leave provisions. So family law, where women's legal capacity is embedded, is um, really, really important for uh, the situation of women on the ground. And again, we are really careful here to say that this is significant association, but there are other studies um, that also actually show that there does seem to be a direct causal effect, that when you see a legal change, you see changes in these um, indicators of women's economic agency. So we're gonna move into the last part of the presentation here, which tackles the question that you may have been wondering about, which is why family law remains discriminatory in the large group of countries where provisions are still um, quite unequal. So just to remind you with the map that we showed you near the beginning of the presentation, um, if you look at the regional clustering of countries with high degrees of discrimination and inequality, it does look like they seem to uh, exist in the MENA, that is the Middle East and North African region, as well as down into Central Africa, um, as well as South Asia. So over by um, uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan. Um, so just looking at the regional clustering, many of those countries have Muslim majority populations. Um, there have been a lot of people uh, who say um, that it must be something about Islam, or it must be something to do with the fact that these countries are, um, have a Muslim majority population. That is, um, some of the popular hypotheses to explain enduring discrimination in family law have to do with the religious status um, of the country. Uh, another popular hypothesis um, coming from decades of literature and comparative politics is that more religious countries have more discriminatory family law. That is, since religious doctrine in many places, and not just religious doctrine, but even secular doctrine, endorsed uh, the subordination of women and male authority in marriage and the family, we therefore should see 
countries where people are more devout. That is where a larger share of the population adheres to traditional religious values and goes to church or goes to the mosque or somehow practices religion um, more regularly, that we should see more religious countries um, uh, with more discriminatory family law. Um, another hypothesis says, well, it's not necessarily the type of religion or how religious people are, but it's something to do with the configuration of relationships between uh, organized religion and the state. Um, something about religion state relations. So um, now, uh, building on my work with uh, Laurel Weldon, specifically, um, we did a couple of articles and then um, this work is most recently summarized in our 2018 book uh, called The Logics of Gender Justice, State Action on Women's Rights Around the World. And there's a chapter in that book which takes a look at family law worldwide and develops an approach to account for the variation that we see. So the work that Francesca was just talking with you about was sort of the outcomes of family law. That is, once you have a particular uh, configuration of family law, what does it imply for women's economic empowerment? This work with Laurel that I'm talking about right now looks at the prior question, which is what types of sociological, political, economic factors account for uh, the different degree to which countries are likely to discriminate against women in family law. So these popular hypotheses um, I'm going to evaluate right now. So this is um, a plot from our book. And basically uh, we have a family law index that, um, is, that we developed to study 70 countries. Uh, this was before, um, we developed this before uh, the World Bank Women, Business and the Law Project got going. And so we developed and coded our own index, but it's less expansive. Um, in the sense that it covers 70 countries. It doesn't cover the 171 that um, we were previously talking about. But, but, but here, just look at this, look at this um, graphic here. Uh, the thing that's important to notice is that the family law index um, works uh, actually in the opposite way. The, the higher score is less discrimination. So a perfect score means that the country is completely equal in its family law. And the lower score means that the country is completely discriminatory in all of the areas that we looked at. But, but basically what I want you to, 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 to capture here, and then on the bottom, the x-axis we see, is the country a Muslim majority country, no or yes? And so what we see is on the left side, we see, yes, if you are not a Muslim majority country, it is fairly likely that you're going to have a more equal uh, set of family laws. Um, but the important relationship is on the right side. If you are a Muslim majority country, you have a family law score that is all over the map. So being a Muslim majority country on its own is not a good predictor of how equal or unequal your family law is. In fact, you could have family law that is just as equal as Norway and Portugal, or you could have family law that looks like uh, Saudi Arabia or Iran, so quite, quite unequal. So simply being Muslim majority or not is a completely inadequate explanation for the state of your family law. What about um, religiosity? So this is the second popular hypothesis uh, that I talked about. Um, so here we see the family law index again, and remember it's reversed from the previous set of analysis with 15 being uh, 15 in the direction of total equality and zero being um, extremely unequal. The religiosity scale we take from the World Values Survey where they ask people questions um, about how often they uh, go to um, church or other organized religious services. And the important thing that I want um, you to take from this is that if you look over on the left side, you see that um, in countries that are not very religious, yes, it is likely that family law is more equal. But in countries that are very religious, that is that have religiosity scores of upward of 80, um, between 80 and 100, we again see countries all over the map. So we see countries with very low discrimination in family law, such as the United States, and we see countries um, with uh, high degrees of discrimination in family law. So 
Laurel and I decided that it, or we realized that it wasn't just religion or religiosity um, that is accounting for discriminatory family law. But our hypothesis was that it's something to do with the extent to which the power of the state, that is the power of the government and the power of the laws and um, organized coercion, the degree to which political institutions uphold particular religious ideas and practices. And so we used an indicator from Jonathan Fox's religion and the state data set, which is basically a count of state, uh, state laws on religious holidays, religious education, government funding for religion, blasphemy, um, whether people are required to uh, belong to a particular religion to hold public office and so forth. And so there is a total of 37 possible laws that are counted. And just to give you a sense um, of the variation here, Saudi Arabia had the highest score. So Saudi Arabia had the highest degree of um, political, uh, we call it political institutionalization of religious authority and the United States had the lowest. So 31 in Saudi Arabia and only one um, in the US. And so we take this count as an indicator of the degree to which public uh, power is invested in upholding a particular set of religious institutions, practices, and ideas. And what we found is that the religious legislation index, which you can see um, on the x-axis here along the bottom of the slide, uh, looked at with the family law index, has a really close relationship. And this regression line is actually controlling, um, uh, actually, I can't remember if it's controlling for a bunch of other factors or not. So you all have to go and look at the book to see exactly what type of analysis we did. But, um, but we can see that there is a pretty good relationship between um, the degree of equality in family law, meaning toward zero, uh, the, uh, actually the degree of equality in family law toward 15 and um, low numbers on the religious uh, legislation index, okay? So this is cross nationally, and this is actually pooling data from 1995 and 2005. Um, so what we wanna conclude with is that, uh, um, we actually then look, um, forgive me, um, at an interaction in our analysis. We look at the interaction between um, religious legislation and religiosity. So for example, there are countries in Northern Europe, Sweden, Norway, and Germany. There are official churches. Um, there are lots of religious laws, but those countries are totally secular. Very few people um, believe in religious doctrine and actually go to organized religious services. So we single, we, we, we um, focus primarily on this interaction of uh, whether a country has a lot of religious legislation and is deeply religiously devout. And it's that combination. It's the power of religious law in a religiously devout country that's a major barrier to reform. And so here we just model the interaction between these two factors. Um, so why, why does this matter? Well, we have a long discussion in our articles and books um, based on field research that we did and interviews that we did in different contexts. And we basically make an argument that what state, that religion is not a thing, right? Religion is not a thing. It's not a single fixed doctrine, but it is a site of struggle. It is an open field where different religious actors vie for authority about who speaks in the name of religion and whose voice uh, actually says what the religion dictates. And what happens when state power gets involved in this field of religion is that it tends to freeze some of the oldest and most patriarchal interpretations of religion. Um, state power also boosts patriarchal interpreters of religion and then links the status of these interpreters and these interpretations to the moral order and the, um, the moral order and the soul of the nation more generally. And so once state power is used to prop up certain versions of religious doctrine, 
and people who, who preach or insist on those versions of religion, it becomes less liable to democratic and deliberative contestation and more insulated uh, from societal changes and influences. So if the state doesn't get involved in religion, there can be um, a greater degree of contestation, of flow, of argument, of participatory um, discursive exchange about what the religion actually is about. But once the state starts to get involved and gives people names and gives people money, it tends to reduce religious pluralism. So the involvement in state power in the field of religion, especially when it comes to issues like family law, reduces religious pluralism and reduces the influence of civil society actors and social changes. Uh, so we also mention other factors that were important in um, the maintenance of discriminatory uh, family law provisions, such as colonialism. So in countries where Western colonial powers came and codified, that is they wrote down family law where it had previously been more free flowing, they tended to codify more patriarchal versions of rules on um, kinship. And they also endowed traditional authorities with the power to administer these rules. So we see this process, especially in um, India and Malaysia where the British came in and they gave certain traditional authorities the right, um, which they previously may not have had to determine rules on kinship. Um, and they wrote down laws where they previously were more flexible. We also see communism as a world historical factor moving in the other direction, okay? So where colonialism and the experience of Western overseas colonialism tended to push countries to have a more conservative or discriminatory codified family law, communism had the opposite effect. Communist rulers in Europe and in Asia used family law as an instrument to actually break up old social orders and to modernize the economy. So communist regimes in Vietnam, China, Cuba, the Soviet Union introduced egalitarian and secular family laws. That doesn't mean that communism was always a force for women's rights. Um, communism by its very nature repressed civil, civic movements, including feminist movements, uh, which precluded change in other areas, especially reproductive, um, sorry, um, violence against women. Um, so uh, anyway, so we see that it's not just uh, the political institutionalization of religious authority, the historical evolving relations between state and religion, but also other major world historical factors like colonialism and communism, which affected family law. So just um, summing up here, and then I'll turn it over to Francesca if she has um, something else to add. Um, we, the takeaways, what are the takeaways from this presentation today? Uh, the first is that um, there's still a lot of variation in spite of the global rights revolution for women. There is still a lot of variation in the degree to which women um, have a formal legal agency or legal capacity. Many countries still have restrictive laws. So in many countries, women still do not have equal rights to own property, to set up a business, to participate in the economy. Um, this variation is something that has endured over time because family law is sticky. It's sticky, it's slow to change. There is a lot of stubbornness and a lot of resistance, particularly in countries where uh, people are religiously devout and where state power upholds a particular version of religious doctrine. Um, and the final thing, which was what Francesca talked about um, most eloquently, uh, was that variation in family law, that is the degree to which women exercise uh, equal rights to formal legal capacity is significantly associated with not just one, but multiple indicators of women's economic empowerment. And so our takeaway from this analysis is that if we want to empower women economically, family law and the reform of family law is, is, is a crucial lever to do that. Um, so I'm going to sign off here, Malaton from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Thank you so much. And Francesca, you have the last word. Thanks so much. Um, I think I just want to add that 
think what we found key in the work we did on looking at the variation in family law is really the importance of unpacking it and thinking about it as multidimensional. Um, and this is something uh, Mala has discussed in multiple of her um, works. Um, and I think in unpacking both the law and unpacking how different types of laws might have um, multiple effects on different types of empowerment is also key. So I think uh, my main takeaway message is to really think about how to unpack as much as possible and think about mechanisms linking legal change and changes in society. Um, and also to bear in mind what we mentioned earlier that uh, reforming laws is um, a precondition for a lot of change taking place. It doesn't necessarily mean that change takes place because that requires a bunch of other steps including um, legal enforcement um, but it's still a really important first step for change to take place and so thanks so much for listening to us and uh, wish we could be there but uh, here signing up uh, signing off from oslo so bye bye